Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Workplace Safety North webinar, new research on root causes of deficient lockout of machinery. My name is Paige Splain, and I'm the Marketing and Events Assistant here at Workplace Safety North. We appreciate your attendance here today and want to mention a few housekeeping items before we get started. Your microphones have been muted, and we ask that you use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen for speaker questions. Questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. If you have any technical issues using the Zoom application, do let us know in the chat box and we'll do our best to help you. Please note this webinar is being recorded. A link to the recording, a copy of the presentation, and resource information will be sent to you within a few days. Today we are joined by Tom Walton and Jerry Treyer from Workplace Safety North. I'll invite Tom on screen now to start today's presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. We appreciate the opportunity to connect with you today to share some information on the results of our pulp and paper, risk assessment and root cause analysis, and how we've carried forward the controls that have been provided by the industry and in implementing those in the work in workplaces based on our, our plans to move that ahead in 2023. Uh, we followed the evidence-based approach to effectively addressing workplace risks by engaging both management and workers in a number of uh, interactions through workshops, starting out with a risk assessment. Uh, that was followed by a root cause analysis where we did a deeper dive on the number one risk that was identified by workers and management in pulp and paper workplaces. And uh, we also uh, summarized the controls that were recommended by the industry and prioritized by the industry for us to carry forward in the development of program material and also sharing that information with industry so that uh, uh, individual firms could compare their overall overall uh, statistical challenges in relation to occupational health and safety uh, to that of uh, similar firms within the industry. And we'll be talking a bit more with regards to the evaluation of effectiveness once uh, we implement that program in 2023. We started off by uh, really discussing and, and, and uh, setting uh, the uh, Swiss cheese model or reasons model here uh, as our basis for our risk assessment. And as you can see, there's a number of uh, blocks here uh, through the Swiss cheese model where it identifies uh, controls that have been put into place. And you can see each of these uh, dominoes or blocks here uh, uh, represent a control that's put into place. But the uh, lighter colored or white colored holes identify um, uh, uh, issues in relation to uh, everything from uh, design issues, uh, gaps in regulations, training material not currently up to date, shortage of skill sets, or unsafe acts that could be completed in the workplace that could result in injury. Um, design issues in relation to uh, guarding, for example, could be a, a piece of equipment which is dated, uh, an older piece of equipment, and the guarding that's in place is not up to the current CSA standards. Also, there's uh, darker colored holes, which could be the absence of controls. And again, in the relation in, in relation to an example in machine guarding, it could be a guard's been removed for maintenance or other purposes and not been replaced, which provides an opportunity uh, for uh, a, an injury to happen in relation to that weakness. Uh, based on a number of these factors coming into play all at once, uh, si or simultaneous failure, uh, there is the opportunity for these risk controls not working the way that we had hoped and could result in a catastrophic event as it shows in the picture at the top right hand corner here. Part of the uh, focus of the workshop was to ensure that we engaged industry and used a bipartite or collective approach. Workshop participants were peer recognized industry experts and we connected with trade associations, um, uh, unionized organizations and others to gain uh, uh, individuals to be brought forward to participate in our workshops. Workshop process was open, transparent and collaborative. 
we worked uh, extremely hard to ensure that everyone within the workshop had the opportunity to participate, share their views, and have their views heard by others. And uh, we had a, a, a good amount of discussion through each, work, through each workshop to uh, provide different opinions and come up with a collaborative approach to best practices. Workshop uh, was virtual, um, uh, completed through the COVID-19 years. Uh, hopefully that won't be continuing any further, but the virtual method worked very well for us and we were able to engage individuals from throughout the province in the process. And ranking and prioritization of causal factors was done by only the worker and management members. Uh, we did have observers uh, through uh, the ministry, as well as representatives from Workplace Safety North who participated in a support role or were just observers in the session as well. But it was only employers and workers that really came up with the results we'll share, for, share with you now. So this is the overall results of the pulp and paper risk assessment, which was completed in 2019. The number one risk that was identified by workers and management in the workplace or the condition which kept them up at night. And this was the question we asked when we uh, developed initial templates prior to the workshop uh, was what keeps you up at night in relation to risks in your workplace? The number one risk which was identified was the category of lockout inadequate or improper lockout was the actual uh, risk that was identified. Uh, some of the others that were identified within the top 10 were uh, under the occupational illness category, exposure to paper dust, exposure to chemical agents such as toxic chemicals, H2S gas and al allergic substances. Under the guarding category, exposure to unguarded moving and or exposed uh, parts on equipment during maintenance. Under the working at heights category, falls from heights. Maintenance also was another category we, we uh, focused on, uh, it, which include structural integrity of building and ceilings falling and some of the older buildings that were addressed. Uh, from a workplace culture perspective, rushing to get the work done, taking shortcuts, again from maintenance, maintenance of a process uh, of process lines and uh, with older process lines linked to number six uh, older buildings, there were leaks and caustic explosions and some uh, potential for caustic explosions. Uh, guarding, caught in, crushed by equipment during operations. And finally, the environment, which included other environmental conditions, which were challenges. The number one risk, lockout or inadequate or improper lockout machines uh, was the risk that we carried forward to our root cause analysis. These are the individuals that participated in our risk assessment session and there were equal representation from both management and workers in the session. We also brought in uh, some industry specialists from Safe Engineering who also provided uh, I, their role again was all, uh, was as a uh, observer and uh, a subject matter expert to provide further guidance and support. And then on the right hand column is a number of representatives from both the uh, the ministry as well as WSN who were there as either supports or observers in the process. This is the overall uh, summary uh, infographic that was put together from the uh, risk assessment process, which identified the top 10 risks that I went through in detail on an earlier slide. This particular document was something that was a recommendation uh, that came out of uh, uh, the uh, a risk, uh, risk assessment session to share the information with industry and put it together in a format that was easy to read, easy to review fairly quickly and something that could be posted in the workplace. So with each of our risk assessment and root cause analysis um, workshops, we summarize the results in this type of format and share it with industry. At this point, I believe I'll be turning it over to Jerry Treyer, who led the root cause analysis session for the pulp and paper industry and is leading our initiative as we're moving ahead and addressing some of those controls. Jerry? All right. Thanks, Tom. 
Uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, Tom had gone through the risk assessment component, and I'm going to be covering off uh, pretty much the rest of uh, these uh, topics as we go forward. So, so we're going to talk first of all about the root cause analysis uh, approach that we took uh, with dealing with um, with this. So the first thing actually we uh, we would do is uh, just confirm. Um, with the group that participated in the risk assessment on the statement, the risk statement that we were going to focus on. And so, um, as Tom showed with the um, the uh, charts that he showed, that uh, lockout was the number one issue that they identified. And in particular, the inadequate or improper lockout of machines resulting in unintended or adverse effects on workers. So this was the topic that we were going to focus on for the root cause uh, analysis uh, component, knowing full well that you know, we could go back and pretty much go through all 10 of those uh, items that were identified, but we wanted to start with the, uh, the top one first uh, moving forward. So to start the uh, process, what, we're, what we did was we used the fishbone diagram to to, to try to keep people focused on the topics that we're trying to look at. So uh, as you see these six topics, uh, these are ones we actually started to ask, you know, are these having an effect on inadequate or improper lockout? So we have tools and machines, process, people, measures, uh, environment, and culture. And so we focused on each of these as we went through the process. This is a kind of a clean copy. This is kind of a messy copy because you can see the person writing there is doesn't can't write straight very often. Um, but what we do up in our office up in North Bay is we're, we were fortunate to have a uh, you know a big whiteboard uh, wall and uh, and so it it really is a brainstorming exercise where we take those six um, topics that we talked about I talked about just a minute ago and start entering information related to those six particular topics. Uh, here is actually a, um, a kind of a, a, sh a short part of it because we expanded a little bit more on these. These are primary uh, root causes. Uh, you can see actually uh, the ones uh, that are in purple, uh, purple dotted line, were the top 10 that we came up with. Um, and there are a lot of information. So if I look at culture, for instance, you could see all of the, in fact, four or five of the uh, top or the four of the topics, uh, the top 10 came from the culture uh, area, things like worker training, shortcuts, inconsistent systems, history of no lockout. Um, and then what we do from there is we start getting into why those are in place. And so we build on that to come up with uh, the next slide as an example. So there is culture. Now, just keep in mind that I'm only from a, a point of being able to see it a little closer. Uh, this is the, the second, the bottom part of that of culture. There is actually, uh, you know, quite a bit more information on the top half. It just, just so be able to see some of this. Uh, we actually broke up some of them into smaller areas or into smaller groups. So for, for worker training, um, you know, you, you could see the colors that are there. So obviously the four headings down on the very bottom are our primary root causes. And then from there, we're asking why those are in place. Why is worker training such a big issue? And, you know, and, and we ended up getting some second level, third level, and even in some cases, fourth level root causes, basically. So, um, you know, and, and so if you could see the green, which is our fourth level, for instance, shortcuts, you know, the hazards are not identified, which lead to, you know, hazard recognition issues, unsafe practices, um, and even, you know, young workers was the third. So. So we're basically really trying to get a lot of the causal factors listed down <clears throat> so that we can look at these in a little more detail. <clears throat> Once the board is uh, completely filled out, 
Uh, we start going back to those primary root causes and we go through a voting process. Uh, as Tom mentioned in the risk assessment, there was also a voting you know, to come up with the uh, top 10. What we were doing was the same thing, basically looking at the category and the primary root cause and voting on those um, from one to five. So what we were doing was coming up with scoring so that we could put these into uh, some form of priority order uh, to, to deal with them a little further. Uh, in this case, you know, worker training. In fact, some of these, uh, there was a lot of similarities between the primary ca root causes. And so what we did was we grouped a couple together, not very many, but we did group a couple together because they just made sense. They, 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 the, the information in that, air, in that prime or root cause, primary root cause was very similar. similar. Uh, the voters too as well, you could see there were seven voters. Uh, these would be all the worker and management representatives. Uh, again, WSN, Ministry of Labor, we didn't participate in the voting. And so we end up with this top 10 list of the uh, primary root causes. And again, here it is here, which is basically what I just mentioned that, you know, we grouped frontline inexperienced workers with worker training because a lot of the um, the second and third level and fourth level causes uh, were very similar. So we kind of grouped some of those together and came up with this top 10 list of worker training, frontline experienced workers, improper lockout, lack of identification of equipment, written procedures, inadequate lockout sheets, shortcuts, inconsistent lockout, uh, even got into fatigue, mental health, vulnerable workers, history of no lockout and interlocks. So those are the top 10 primary causal factors. All right, and then that pretty much like when we get together with our group, uh, you know, it's basically the root cause analysis has taken up pretty much the first full day. The day, second day, we're coming back to those 10, top 10, and putting some more detail in around the controls that we wanna see put in place. Um, I, I do have all 10 here, but I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, we can, this, it'll all be available when Paige uh, puts this on, uh, avail, makes it available to everyone. So the first one that we actually talk about is the, uh, is worker training. So worker training with frontline inexperienced workers seem to be one of the bigger issues there. Uh, we were having a lot of uh, a, a, com a conversation around the trainers that are training people, not only the in-class version of the training, but also the actual practical part when they go out into the workplace. Um, a lot of discussion around, you know, new workers, you know, newer workers being, or new workers being trained by even, or by being trained by, you know, inexperienced instructors. And uh, and you'll see as I talk about you know our going forward where we kind of stood with that. But we, you know, we had um, you know things like you know proper evaluation. The training is understood that there might have been a little bit of a lack of that uh, set of standardized corporate guidelines for lockout training, training tailored to the type of equipment. Uh, in the specific plants based on examples from that plant, site-specific training programs, energy type streams, uh, steam examples. Um, so we ended up coming up with a whole bunch of things that we wanted to see incorporated into this, this uh, process. So, And again, uh, this was number two, which is improper lockout, lot around proper identification of, of the equipment. Um, you know, keeping things up to date, uh, need to be proper, lockout pre procedures need to be, you know, properly written for each piece of equipment. So we talked a little bit about general lockout versus uh, machine specific lockout. You know, again, contents of piping identified by color codes, uh, and then exploring engineering solutions and artificial intelligence. So for some of the things we identified here. 
So I, I think um, I think I'm not going to go through much more of this. Let me let me go through the written procedures and then the rest of it. Uh, you can view all those comments that we have, all those uh, controls or things we'd like to see in place. You know, this one here for written procedures was another one that was fairly uh, big. Uh, develop corporate lockout policy. You know, having an annual review of that corporate lockout policy. Uh, developing site-specific work instructions, outlining roles and responsibilities, uh, and then you know, a, a reviewing a process for when there is a process change or an incident. So whenever something like that were to happen, you know, that would uh, generate a review of the particular process or the procedure in question. Okay, so you can go. Uh, a little further, skip through the rest of these uh, page. Thank you. And you can see from that 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 we develop, you know, quite a bit of controls for each of them. I mean, we end up with hundreds of controls uh, that we wanted to try to incorporate. So Tom showed you the uh, top ten infographic for uh, the root or the risk assessment component. And so one of the things we're able to do now is actually give a top 10 of the root causes of, uh, of our top number one hazard that we identified. So, so that's another infographic, another you know, visual type of thing that people can see. And, and, and we can share this quite easily with a lot of, uh, a lot of our clients. So, so uh, with this, we actually developed a provincial initiative based on some of the items that were identified. So this initiative will assist various sectors supported by WSN. Um, and so, and the important part there is we're talking more than just various sectors uh, other than pulp and paper, mining, forestry, logging, uh, even our corrugating sector, which we're kind of in the process of doing this same initiative now. So, um, you know, we, we will recognize the current shortcomings with existing lockout programs. We're going to look at lack of on-site training consistencies and a cultural shift required to ensure that the desired elimination of lockout uh, related incidents. So this initiative will leverage the ev evidence-based approach through industry partnerships, rollouts of the lockout program effectiveness template, and I'll speak to some of this in a minute, awareness sessions, training, and consulting programs. So, so we're really moving this forward, uh, trying to come up with some, uh, some issues. Now, the other thing that, that, you know, Tom and I really didn't talk about when we, when we got together with, with these uh, participants from the various locations is we really made sure that we tried to focus on the sector or like the pulp and paper sector as a whole. We encourage the, the participants not to be thinking about it from their workplace perspective, but thinking about it from the whole the whole, uh, the whole pulp and paper sector. So it was a little bit of a, you know, we, we wanted to make sure when we come up with issues or controls that it was gonna be more than just helping a, a one of the participant or one of the participant uh, companies, but all of the companies in the pulp and paper sector. All right, so for our next step and what I'm presently working on with our advisory committee uh, is to improve client understanding of lockout related on-site gaps using an assessment tool. So we're in the process of developing a tool that you know, both us, uh, uh, our WSN field staff, and, and even uh, clients will be able to utilize to see where they are, where they stand with their, with their lockout program. Are there any gaps in the program? Um, and so from there, we're going to be able to gather a lot of information on the, on the pulp and paper sector around uh, the gaps that are there. From there, we're going to enhance the consist or the competency of on-site trainers by providing a train the trainer program, you know, addressing risk-related content as well as information on principles of adult learning and instructional technique. So, trying to get our these instructors that are instructing from the
the classroom portion of uh, of lockout, but to get them a little more understanding of you know adult learning techniques, instructional techniques to be more effective uh, with their training. We're going to improve client uh, lockout program engagement, application, and improved workplace culture. So that's something we're going to be focusing on when we go in, uh, talking with workers, supervisors, managers around the whole concept of culture and making sure that, you know, things that we can incorporate going forward are going to help those clients become more effective and their program will be more, more effective. And then subject matter experts will allow for improved resources, guidance to enhance WSN's uh, support of its uh, clients. So those are kind of the things we're moving forward with. Uh, we will be doing a lot more of the assessment tool uh, assessments uh, in 2023, right? You know, right at the, in the new year, and uh, and then gathering a lot of information from those documents. And this is one of the uh, documents that we've uh, we've uh, started to develop. Basically, this is more of a promotional pamphlet to go out to our clients that our field staff will be able to provide people to show them what we've done, how we went about it, um, and what we were going to be offering for to try to uh, get people to buy in, to you know, take a good look, get a hard look at their lockout program and see how it measures up. Uh, it, it, you know, in a lot of cases when we're dealing with clients, I mean, we have a pretty broad range of uh, of programs that are out there, and try and all we're we're looking to do is try to, you know, move uh, maybe the the performers down at the bottom of the list, moving them up much higher, and even the ones that are doing a fairly good job of even extending that even even more. So, so this is kind of the process we're going to be looking at going forward. Um, is to uh, is to get out and do some of these assessments for um, with our clients. And I think that's yep. So um, go ahead, Paige. Sure. Thanks, Tom, and thanks, Jerry. Um, so we do have a few audience questions to get through before we wrap up. So the first question we have is, how much influence do decisions made by others above the workers, such as managers, owners, et cetera, who are not directly involved affect the likelihood of an incident? So uh, that's a, actually a good question. I think we talked a little bit about culture uh, today and, uh, and, and, and that, you know, and, and those people that, um, that are above the worker, supervisor, even higher up managers, owners, uh, you know, have a huge impact on how culture is going to work and how the workplace is actually going to uh, improve on safety performance. I get this asked this question quite regularly that, uh, you know, people ask me, you know, is it the committee? You know, is it the workers? Is it the supervisors? And I, I usually speak to you know, the fact that uh, it, it's, it is, you know, when I see really workplaces that are doing a, a really good job from a health and safety perspective, even with lockout, um, it is usually the senior people, senior most person, uh, person in the workplace that is the driving force behind improving. Um, there used to be, there's a company that I worked with um, and, and the manager, and I would do training there pretty regularly. And, um, you know, I, I was there very first time many years ago. And uh, as I was sitting there training with a handful of people, uh, this plant manager walked into the training room and, you know, proceeded to the back of the room and grabbed a cup of coffee and came and sat down with the workers, uh, one of the tables. And I thought, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. Sending a strong message of how important this is. Uh, little did I realize as, as time went on, that uh, that this person did this every course I did there, and I did probably multiple courses, uh, and he would show up all the time, and 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 what he's doing is driving the message that safety is important, and uh, and 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 I think that's really where I really noticed that 
with this particular workplace that that there was that person that that was setting the tone for the rest of the workers and uh, the rest of the employees and and so i i would pretty much say that it's it is that top person and and on the flip side if that person is not be not really committed to health and safety you know that message you know becomes loud and clear with all the rest of the people at that workplace hopefully that answers your question Thanks, Jerry. The next question we have is, uh, was mobile equipment slash pedestrian interface discussed as a significant risk? You want me to tackle that one too, Tom? Sure, Jerry. I, I looked through the list quite quickly and it was not uh, near the top of the list. It didn't uh, obviously didn't make the top 10 or we would have reviewed it today. But uh, go ahead and jump in, Jer yeah, Jerry. I because... just, I, I just want to go like we are in the process. In fact, next week we're we're um, we're meeting to do the root cause analysis for our corrugating sector. So we've gone through the root uh, the risk assessment portion of it. And, uh, and in fact, we had three, um, three of those uh, events were contact with mobile equipment and worker interface or interaction. Um, in fact, number two was um, that interaction, you know, and workers getting injured. In fact, with the, with the, with the corrugating sector, their number one issue was in fact lockout. And, uh, and then we, uh, when we got together last week, we decided, or in fact, they decided uh, that we weren't going to do lockout because we were doing it in the pulp and paper sector. And all of the stuff we're working on is going to be able to be utilized with the, with the um, you know, it, with, the, with the corrugating sector. And so they're going to benefit from that. But then we're going next week, we're going to be doing the root cause analysis component looking at that interaction between mobile equipment and the workers so and that'll be shared with the pulp and paper industry as well that's, when we that's uh, true. have the yeah. final results thank you so the last question we have is how are interlocks sorry we have two coming in how are interlocks a casual factor i i think it was associated with a causal factor interlocks uh uh, would be uh, one of the controls that we put into place. Jerry, did you uh, recall any reference to interlocks being a, a causal factor? Yeah, actually, uh, the, the causal factors that were coming up um, were around people uh, relying on uh, interlocks instead of locking out the equipment properly. So people, you know, if they if there was a a door and people opened it and it disengaged the equipment. Um, people were kind of going into the machinery uh, without locking it out. They were relying on the interlocks. And that was a lot of where the discussion was, was the reliance that that these interlocks were are, are just as effective as a lockout. So and uh, and there, there I think the ministry has been pretty clear on that, that it's not and that uh, it actually is can be unsafe and 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 think or make workers think that they're being protected when in fact they're not. Um, so uh, that individual just uh, wants to say thank you for the clarification on the interlocks. And uh, we do have another question here: uh, Was lockout verification discussed as a control, i.e., a buddy system? Yeah, I can start off with this and let Jerry finish it off. Uh, we actually, through the advisory committee that Jerry mentioned, uh, we did link in with the a, a BC advisory committee where they've implemented a, a quite an extensive uh, buddy verification or two-person verification system for lockout. Um, our advisory committee wanted to learn from leading practices in BC and are considering how it could possibly be uh, discussed uh, during um, our workplace assessment that Jerry mentioned for lockout, as well as any subsequent training as a leading practice. So Jerry, I'll turn it over to you. I know you mentioned this to the advisory committee as well. Yeah, I think, uh, it, you know, the, that verification process uh, is uh, probably will be a key component with that. So not only, you know, verifying as in, uh, 
you know, jogging, you know, in situations where we need to have equipment, you know, um, or, or, you know, doing the, the test bump, uh, but also verifying, you know, there's a component, I think your BC group had a component built into theirs where a supervisor would go through and verify that everything on the lockout program or the permit, if you want to call it that, uh, was done correctly. So, so there is, uh, you know, not only verifying that the equipment was locked out and not starting up, but also having frontline supervisors or, you know, safety people uh, going through and verifying that the, the process has been done correctly. It was interesting during our discussion with the BC group, one real benefit that they saw is the discussion didn't just focus on lockout. It looked at a risk assessment of any other potential hazards that could be uh, the worker could interact with during the lockout process. And they found that uh, the additional risk assessment identified a number of weaknesses and put uh, potential repairs, which were repaired. And they found that it actually sped up their lockout process as they move forward because a lot of these things that were slowing down the lockout or creating a disconnect or an outage were resolved uh, as uh, part of that risk assessment, which was quite interesting. Perfect, thank you. Uh, that's all the audience questions we have. So um, Tom, Jerry, are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave with the audience before we wrap up? Sure, I can start. One of the items I did want to mention is all the results of the risk assessment, as well as the root cause analysis, are posted on the WSN website. So feel please feel free to check them out, as well as we have all other risk assessment and root cause analysis data also posted on our website for, for reference by the industry. And we will have subsequent articles as well as information regarding our ongoing work with the uh, lockout tag uh, advisory committee um, that Jerry mentioned as well. And I think Tom, you covered it off actually <laughs> quite well. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you for attending today's webinar on new research on root causes of deficient lockout of machinery. As a reminder, a copy of the presentation and the recording will be emailed to you within the next few days and posted to the resources page of workplacesafetynorth.ca. Thanks again for joining and have a safe day. Bye.